We are really over time, and I, there's one gentleman here that hasn't spoken, and he hasn't spoken because we've asked him not to speak, but he is one of the most vocal individuals who's got a lot of experience and knowledge on this issue, who's been writing letters and communicating his views to many people. We're giving him five minutes, Martin, I'm afraid, I'm going to give you ten, to give his views on what he's heard today and to reflect on a few points that he has been sharing in the media, uh, and I look forward to that. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, right, yeah. Martin, five, do you want to say a little five, word about yourself to begin with, please? Five minutes. Uh, <laughs> five minutes and tell that, us who you are. That is mission impossible. Um, I was on the government's uh, Badgers and TV consultative panel way back in the age of the dinosaurs, about 1990, representing your good selves, the National Federation of Badger Groups. I have a website. If you ask Mr. Google, it's badgersontv.com, badgersontv, all one word. And please, please look, <coughs> death of the great debate, because that is an updated thing. I can actually send you an email copy of it. But there was a, a very splendid review by Professor Godfrey. Um, Professor Godfrey, yes. Uh, two, 2013. It's in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Um, and they, he goes through with a panel of 10, ten co-authors, Crystal Donnelly, Rosie Woodruff, um, a vet from Cambridge, uh, Professor Keo, and they actually asked the advice of about 60 different epi epidemiologists, and they came out with a list of, I think it was about 37 areas of uncertainty uh, over the whole issue of badgers and TB. Do, do they actually give uh, TB to cows? Is it the other way around? Do cows work? And so on and so forth. Now, as I say, mission impossible, but the fact is nobody actually understands how TB works in cows, and that's how badgers got the blame in the first place. So to go right back to basics, um, as John said, TB in cattle is the same as in humans. It's a bronchopneumonia. It's a progressive disease. Uh, it, the, the lung, in, it, it arrives as, a, as an aerosol, uh, the crops of infection. And the progression of the um, disease in the lungs, you have uh, small, no visible lesions. They gradually increase in number and size. It takes about one year to get to the stage where you have visible lesions and abattoir inspection, and then it goes beyond that to cavitation. Uh, this, this is exactly the same as happens in humans. So basically, um, you have two sorts of reactors to the skin test. There are the unconfirmed ones without lesions, and then there are the confirmed ones. Now. The whole saga. Can you all hear, by the way? Yeah, we're hearing you. Okay. Yeah, but we can't well. see. The whole. Sorry. Okay. It's just a little bit towards the audience. Yeah, I, I, it's a That's bit fine. To, uh, That's okay. Is that right? Um, we had these splendid. Uh, this, this actually is, is a, 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 my, my submission to the uh, Tate Mob. This is a, a pregnant man leaving, uh, about nine months gone. Or if you look at it more closely, you'll see it's a map of dear old GB. Now, the maps that you saw earlier, uh, it came down from countrywide, which I didn't show actually, but from countrywide, down to tiny southwest hotspots. Uh, the low point was 1979. Uh, there were the, the, the seven worst counties. Um, there were just a, about 100 breakdowns a year. The low point was 79 with 89 herds and 600 reactors, and we then had it spread explosively <coughs> within the pop cattle population to the situation in 2008, where there were some eight, uh, eight it, it went outwards. Uh, this, this, oh, this is Wales, by the way. So um, it, it actually spread from these little pockets, spread slowly outwards about 10 miles a year. Uh, a year. Um, 
That in, in about 1980-ish uh, was the last residue in, in Ditted. There was a, a cluster of chronic herbs. There's dear old Land's End. There's Thornbury, that's Heartland. Uh, but anyway, uh, 2008, we got up to about 8,000 herds under restriction and 40,000 reactive cattle. Now, as was pointed out in the course of the debate, uh, Wales very sensibly, uh, TB actually doubled from 2006 to 2008, from 6,000 to 12,000 reactors. Dear old uh, Christian Glossop brought in annual testing of the whole national herd. <coughs> it came straight back down by uh, 2013 14, it was down to 6,000, so it had halved. Now, oh yes, the, to go back <coughs> to the incredibly silly mistake. <coughs> Um, that happened at, by the, our dear friend John Gallagher. I'm sure he was a nice guy. In fact, I debated with him. But in the Zuckerman report, he... Uh, oh, yes, sorry. I meant what I should have said was... So you have these uh, intractable hotspots of TB. Now, there must be a self-sustaining reservoir of TB within those hotspots. And the big question is, was it cattle or was it badger? Mm. Now, John Gallagher, uh, as I say, in Zuckerman, made the incredibly silly mistake of assuming that only visible lesion cattle, open visible lesions, were infectious. So he ruled out cattle as the infectious source of the problem. And another uh, guess at the same time, uh, John Wildsmith did a couple of studies on epidemiology and decided that all of these unconfirmed reactors were false positive. Because you didn't find le uh, lesions at avatar inspection, he assumed they didn't have TB. Uh, so these are unconfirmed, false positive, <coughs> not a problem. Now, that is the crux, the whole crux of the thing, because... Um, in fact, uh, yeah, oh, going back to this, so now, now the situation is we have the high risk area, which is the whole of the southwest and the whole of Wales. Um, roughly 60% of breakdowns are unconfirmed. These are caused by and first identified, identified by uh, unconfirmed reactive cattle without lesions. <coughs> uh, spreading outwards, it's something like 90 to 100 percent are unconfirmed. Now, to go back to this, um, to go back to this uh, thing here, um, one of the most astonishing things in this whole debate is it should have been blindingly obvious that there wasn't a self-maintaining reservoir of TB in the badgers in these these hotspots, because in fact at the time. Uh, it, was it was mentioned on one of the slides, the clean ring strategy found that uh, TB and badgers only occurred one or two TB badgers per social group at two or three social groups at the epicenter of the herd breakdown. Now, this is one of the first ones in Winchester Park. Uh, that's North, North Winchester and that's Atkin. In fact, they culled um, 11 social groups and found TB in six of them. But, but out of 67 badgers, there were only 14 with TB. And in fact, um, TB in these social groups does actually die out. And that's a study by Delahaye uh, within X years as the, the actual TB badgers die off. In fact, there's very, very little evidence for spread within uh, the badger groups or between badger groups and the other study I should just quickly mention going back uh, Dr. Cheeseman he did pop and Little and Wildsmith did populations in fact they did a study in Cornwall uh, they did a study uh, that's Thornbury um, that's Winchester that's Steeple Leeds they also did Staffordshire and Sussex and in all of those areas they found the same pattern of TB and badgers just a few at the epicenter of the herd breakdown. 
And in fact, one of the, the very striking figures from the uh, from Rosie Woodruff's paper, two thousand and five, um, the first the first culls there were three hundred and fifty seven. Uh, it doesn't really matter. There were three hundred fifty seven TV badgers, uh, and the the previous year, uh, the number of reactive cattle, and there's a direct correlation. The the, uh, the worst TV triplets had DIJ had the highest level of TB in badgers. There's a direct spillover. Um, now, sorry, Martin, I'm going to have to bring you. To, can you bring you to your conclusion? Uh, right? Well, very quickly then. This is, this is very very important. Um, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that the, there are three different tests which are used. The skin test is only good for that bit. It's, a, it's 65 to 85, 80% effective. So it's missing a very substantial number. The interferon test catches the early ones, but what nobody's actually mentioned, and very, very importantly, is the thing, once it gets past the, the stage, it, it switches from a, a cellular immune response, which is swamped by the proliferation of bacilli, so it goes over to an antibody response. Now, in Ireland, for quite some time, they've been routinely using a thing called the chemiluminescent NFAIR test, which is a late TB antibody test. It's a blood test. And this is absolutely brilliant for TB in chronic herds. Um, <coughs> One of the gentlemen there said that, in fact, herd depopulation was the way to stamp out pockets like uh, Land's End. In fact, that went clear in 1985, and it stayed clear for three years, simply because they took out a dozen or so chronic herds which had these uh, late TB, um, uh, they're, they're called anergic reactors. Uh, they don't react to the skin virus. <coughs> they sit there in the herd, you know, time after time due to this. They, they pass the skin test. You'll only find them with the antibody test, but they're active spreaders. So that is the way now to, uh, to clear these uh, uh, chronic herds. And in fact, um, Andy, Andy Biggs, went to, went, a British cattle went across to Ireland to, to look at this. I can't understand why. I mean, that, that, that herd which you mentioned, James Griffiths, uh, he was under restriction 11 years. Unfortunately, he probably became chronically infected with one of these um, allergic cows uh, after foot and mouth, and um, it finally died off, and that's when he went clear. But if he'd used the, 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 the antibody test, it could have been much, much sooner. Uh, closing point, please, Martin. Literally have to close it now, so we've got... Sorry yeah, to OK, you. well... Yeah, two very, well, yeah, two very quick things. Okay. Uh, the two pilot culls, yeah. four, two, four, nine, four, uh, what I, I didn't really ever, ever get round to it, but in fact there's absolutely no evidence that badgers can actually give TB, TB to cattle. Um, if, if you look at my, <laughs> my website, uh, it's a, TB in cattle is 100% a respiratory infection. Um, it, it, and you know you won't you won't badgers can't it, it's prolonged close contact with cattle in barns that spreads it. A badger popping into a barn won't do it. And in fact, there are so few uh, super infectious badgers, it's simply not possible. Um, okay, one more point. That's it, Martin. Yeah. Sorry, You're being generous, but we're not really quick yeah. on time. Right. Okay. The other. The other. <laughs> Give us, man, give us the one that's the most important to you that you want us to remember. 2494, Badgers, Culls, and the two pilots, based on the ISG RBCT data, about 400 of those might have had TB, and about two dozen at the very most might have been super infectious.